Hello, we're back with part two of the gradient. One thing that I've noticed with the gradient, that's something that confuses me and I think continues to confuse others, is the idea that it's a derivative. And although we are taking partial derivatives to find the gradient, let's think about, um, for example, if I had a curve in two dimensions, which we dealt a lot with in calculus, uh, one and two, <clears throat> let's call it z, and its output will be, or its input will be y, and y squared equals z, so we have the y-axis, the z-axis, and this is our function. Now, when we found a derivative, we always kind of imagined that we were finding the tangent line. So for example, let's say that I wanted to find what the derivative is when y equals one. And you know, we, we would draw it like this. We would say, well, we're trying to find its rise over its run. You know, what's its change in y to its change in z? And we were trying to find this slope here, the tangent. But we weren't actually finding a vector, even though we were pretending they were arrows. We were always finding a scalar value. And to prove that, I'll go ahead and take the derivative of z with respect to y. And for y squared, it gives us 2y. Now when y equals 1, I'll plug it in here, and therefore, when y equals 1, uh, the slope is 2. So in other words, m equals 2 at this point, the point where y equals 1 on the graph. And you'll notice that's, that's a scalar value that's not, that's not in fact a vector value. So even though we were drawing arrows to kind of get it in our mind what was going on here, they were never vectors, they were always just values. Um, of change. And so when we switch to the gradient, it can be kind of weird because we're taking a bunch of derivatives of a function to find it. So it should, uh, it should be, you know, some sort of a rate of change. Um, and that is somewhat true. So in order to describe that, um, I'm going ahead, I'm going ahead and taking uh, this same function I was using last time, the paraboloid. Um, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at its gradient. So once again, if I take the gradient of f, um, that is a, a three-dimensional, there's an output and two inputs, I will now get a two-dimensional output. You always get one dimension less with the gradient than where you started. So now we're looking, we're looking at these lines that we talked about last time that always point in the direction of greatest growth. So in other words, if you want to get up the mountain quicker, which path should you take? The gradient will never point in the wrong direction. It will always point you in the correct direction. So one thing I also talked about but I did not really explain very well is that as we get further away from this paraboloid, the, uh, the gradient vector lines get longer. And the reason why that is is because the slope the slope at the beginning of a paraboloid is very small, just like with the parabola I drew. But as you start going out, the rate that the uh, tangent line grows is much rapid, uh, much more rapid. So you end up with larger gradient vectors because there is a larger slope. So not only do the gradient vectors point you in the direction of fastest ascent, they also give you the slope of fastest ascent as well. So, for example, if I wanted to evaluate this point 0, 1, I would go ahead and plug in 0 for x, 1 for y, and my gradient of this function evaluated at 0, 1 would give me a vector 0, 2. And what you'll notice here is, is remember, we, we were just doing this with a parabola. This is why I did it this way and I use this as the y-axis and the z-axis, because we evaluated it, we evaluated this parabola at when y equals one, and we found that its slope for z equals y squared, so we found that the rate of change of z with respect to y was two y, we plugged in y equals one and we found that the slope was two. Now we just did the same thing with the gradient, You'll notice that the point I picked had no x, x components, uh, which was just to kind of um, compare it to our 2D world that we're so used to. Um, but in fact, the gradient 
will always tell you the rate of change in the fastest directions. So for example, um, if I pick, let's say instead of just something with a Y component, let's say I picked my point, uh, let's say I picked my point one, one, and now I would get two and two when I plugged it into my gradient, which means that the fastest descent is a combination of the rate of change in the X direction and the rate of change in the Y direction. And so in fact, this is the rate of change in the X direction for fastest ascent at the point one, one, and this is the fastest ascent in the Y direction. Now it kind of makes sense why when we're just looking at a Y and Z direction for this paraboloid, that the fastest ascent is going to be purely in the Y direction. Because moving in the X direction at this point, it actually does nothing for you. If you move at the X here, you'll kind of start going around in a circle, uh, kind of just uh, parallel to the XY plane, so you don't gain any height there. Um, so what we can do with this, um, but once again, this is not a derivative. This tells us a normal to the curve. It shows us the greatest uh, path of ascent. Now, it does have derivative information inside of it, but in and of itself, it's a vector. And the rate of change that we've been used to for the rest of calculus is scalar. But we can use this to find certain kinds of derivatives. Uh, one of those derivatives is called a directional derivative. Directional derivative. And what this does for you is you can pick a direction. So in other words, because remember this is telling us the rate of change for the fastest ascent. So that's the fastest way to get up. Well, what if we don't want to go the fastest way? but we want to figure out what the rate of change is when we're going up some other path. So let's say that we pick, let's say that we pick a direction of travel. Let's say that we want to travel um, in this direction. So I'll give you a vector here. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out what would the rate of change be if we traveled in the uh, direction of this projection. So in other words, we're moving from here to there, and now we want to know what the rate of change is going to be for that ascent. And so this, we're going to call this vector u. It is going to be a unit vector. That's important. Um, so if we want to figure out traveling in this direction, what the uh, slope is in that direction, in both uh, when combined, the x and y are combined. So in other words, if we're traveling in the u direction, there's only one slope. When you have the gradient, it gives you two components of that slope. But we just want to find the combined slope when traveling in u's direction. And so to do that, what we do is we use the dot product. And so to find, um, I believe they call it big D u, um, well, how did it go again? There's a special notation for this. It's uh, maybe something like this, uh, big D U F, and what it stands for is the derivative uh, of F in the direction of U. And what it is equal to it is equal to the gradient. It's equal to the gradient of F, which gives us this intrinsic information of route of fastest ascent and then we dot it with the unit vector in the direction of which we're interested. And because u is a unit vector, it's of length 1, so multiplying by 1 won't change the graph's true values. What it will tell you, though, is no longer the fastest ascent. Now it's you get to choose your ascent, and now you know what the slope is. And so that's called a directional derivative. And this does give you a true slope value. It's one value. Um, it's the slope traveling in that direction uh, along this paraboloid. So I hope directional uh, derivatives are kind of making sense and seeing it visually helps. Uh, I'll see you next video.